Some of the largest wildfires ever recorded are raging across the West. Millions of acres have burned in California, already 10 times more than an average fire season. Dozens are dead. Firefighters like Michael Seaton, who lost his home in the deadly 2018 campfire, have worked more than a month straight. This year, because of, of the short staffing, we were doing 48-hour shifts. I've seen people be standing up and uh, with their eyes closed, and, and they're basically asleep. Whole neighborhoods are gone in Oregon, where 10% of the state's population has faced evacuation orders. The sky turned orange, and dangerous methane-filled smoke has reached as far as Europe. Colorado's Pine Gulch fire is the largest in state history, while an area 15 times the size of Seattle has burned in Washington. This is also a wildfire year with record burning in other parts of the planet. Fires that are burning north of the Arctic Circle in regions where we've never mapped fires before. All of this is on the heels of wildfire emergencies in 2019, 2018, 2017, that points to the pattern of how climate warming is predisposing large landscapes to unprecedented fire activity. Climate change has brought record-breaking heat waves and drought, leaving dried out vegetation easily sparked by lightning and by people. From downed power lines to cars backfiring, cigarette butts flicked out car windows, and gender reveal parties gone wrong, nearly 85% of wildland fires in the U.S. are caused by people. Every year we map more than a million large wildfires, fires larger than 100 acres. Almost all of those large wildfires are started by people. At the same time, humans are moving to wildfire-prone areas in droves. Some of the people that lost their house in the campfire relocated to areas that are now they've lost their house for a second time. How, as a country, are we spending our money? Are we going to have an F-35 dogfight with the Russians or the Chinese? Maybe. But the more likely thing is we're going to continue to burn our citizens over. As devastating fires become the norm year after year, what are the ways we're scrambling to get them under control? From massive spending that's not enough to attacking from both land and air, how has the way we fight forest fires changed over the decades? And will fire prevention and detection technology ever catch up with the rapid rate at which the West is burning? In the 1800s, wildland firefighting was primarily focused on protecting resources like timber from burning. Now, as the population booms and moves farther into wilderness areas, firefighting is about protecting people's lives, homes, and businesses. But one thing has remained constant. Big fires mean big financial losses. Ultimately, everybody's risking a lot of resiliency in the U.S. economy by not dealing with this problem. Fire suppression costs the federal government upwards of $3 billion each year, with state agencies spending billions more. And the economic toll after a fire has ravaged an area is far greater. Australia's record wildfires last year cost the continent more than $110 billion in losses. And with wildfires nearly five times more frequent in the western U.S. since the 1970s, and what was once a four-month fire season now lasting six or even eight months, the costs are only growing. You have the homes going down, you have the infrastructure going down, you have the habitat going down. Who's going to go to these places anymore? The money for firefighting comes from city, state, and federal funds. There has to be good, strong forest management, which I've been talking about for three years with the state, so hopefully they'll start doing that. But the federal government also carries responsibility for forest management. We acknowledge our role and responsibility to do more in that space, but one thing is fundamental. 57% of the land in this state is federal forest land. 3% is California. So we really do need that support. In practice, forest management has become a complicated game of catch-up. For years, the money set aside for it ends up being used to fight active fires that are far larger than budgets accounted for. And further cuts to those budgets in the face of the global pandemic adds extra strain. California, for example, was poised to spend more than $1 billion to prepare for future fires. But its $54 billion budget deficit means that spending is on hold. And amid concerns over a high rate of COVID infection in prisons, California released hundreds of inmates in August who normally serve as firefighter hand crews that clear vegetation from a line that helps contain a fire. The decrease in manpower adds more strain to fire crews already pushed to the limit. I've been on shift for going on 35 days now. Some people have been out 40 plus days. It's just been a very, very long, difficult fire season. They're sleeping in dirt. 
They're, they're without food. They get stuff in their eyes and their lungs. It's miserable. It wears out your body. It really does. And with this season's fires burning within miles of Silicon Valley, home to the world's tech giants and some of their billionaire leaders, some are calling for more money and ideas to stop the trend. They should be involved in wide-scale fuel reduction program, donating more to their local fire services. There is no place on the planet where there is a greater disconnect between high tech and climate change is where the titans of Silicon Valley live. It's scary. While some wealthy homeowners can afford private firefighting crews, the vast majority of firefighters work for the government. There are local, city, and county fire departments, state agencies like CAL FIRE, and federal firefighters from the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. Hundreds of agencies can work together on the biggest fires, although it's not always all hands on deck. So it's finding that balance where we can send as much help as we can to others, but also kind of keep in our back pocket people in case we get a fire locally. So our initial gear pack is probably right around 20 to 30 pounds. And then you throw on another 40, 45 pounds of hose on top of that, as you're moving back and forth all day long. It's a very physically demanding job. The tools are nothing new. Axes, shovels, rakes, chainsaws, to help them clear brush and control which way a fire burns. Crews also fight fire with fire, burning ahead of a blaze so there's no unburnt kindling to catch. Intentional fires are also used to prevent future fires. Native American tribes used to hold annual controlled burns, but with tribes displaced, these largely stopped, and California adopted a standard policy of total fire suppression. Decades later, this has left a thick buildup of vegetation that dries out every summer and ignites easily. Now some governments are partnering with tribal leaders to restore cultural burns. When a fire does get out of control, there are many types of vehicles that can be deployed. Bulldozers remove brush to create a big dirt containment line. Fire engines carry at least 500 gallons of water, with wildland engines built specifically for rough terrain and to pump water on a fire while driving. When it comes to very hard to reach trails and backcountry, sometimes the Forest Service sends supplies in on a team of mules. We're very, very slow to change. Why can Elon Musk do what he's doing? because people will buy thousands of cars, but fire departments will buy one fire engine every seven years. One new type of vehicle is a remote-controlled robot called Colossus, used to fight last year's fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral when it got too dangerous for humans to venture in safely. In a forest, we're dealing with miles and miles of fire line that's changing locations all the time, whereas the Colossus has to be set up you know, with a huge support structure, a huge water supply, and a giant pump to, to make it all work. Some rural areas don't have fire hydrants at all. Here, fire crews drive in water on big tankers or water tenders. In rural areas, it's often faster to drop large amounts of water from aircraft, some as small as single-seaters with 100-gallon buckets to a 747 super tanker that can drop 19,000 gallons from four pressurized tubes in the bottom of the plane. Built in 1992, this largest of the firefighting aircraft was originally a Japan Airlines passenger Boeing 747. Now it's deployed up to five times a day with a drop that can fill a swimming pool in eight seconds. Keep in mind, though, all those air resources, they can be grounded due to high winds, they can be grounded due to smoke. They can be grounded due to visibility. And sometimes the public's like, what are you guys doing? And it's like, well, they're not dying. That's what they're doing. Helicopters were introduced to the fire service in the 60s. They can do emergency rescues or drop water on a fire after using a large bucket or snorkel to suck it out of a nearby source or from a portable tank. We only had one helicopter. So he has to fly all the way down to get water at this other location where he can get water and then come all the way back up the hill and then make another drop. By the time that happened, the fire had gotten away from us. That's why retired fire battalion chief Mark Whaling developed the helihydrant, a stationary tank that rapidly fills with water at the push of a button from a helicopter pilot above. Some have been installed in Orange County and he's working with water agencies to get them in other areas soon. We would be saving that copter so much time flying down to find water and if we place these around a city, we could change the dynamics of how we suppress fires. Aircraft also drop substances besides water, an area that's seen a flurry of recent innovation. 
Stanford developed a gel-like treatment it claims is environmentally benign. Popular retardant Fozcheck is bright pink, so pilots can see where they already dropped it. Blaze Tamer is a new chemical agent added to water so the molecules adhere together instead of turning into mist when dropped. There are foams that break down water so it can soak in better, although exposure to these can increase the risk of thyroid disease and cancer. They have impacts on the soil also, so we have to not drop them near streams or not put them in areas where we'd have problems because what, what does it matter if we stop the fire but we kill off the last species that has been there for a million years? And then there's aerial firefighters. Federal agencies employ around 300 smoke jumpers, experienced firefighters who parachute into remote areas with enough gear to make them self-sufficient for at least 48 hours. There's also crews trained specifically to repel out of helicopters. Some fire agencies send drones to map fire perimeters or even drop small balls of fire to burn up dry brush where they don't want a fire to go. Fire is an integral part of that whole process. That rebirth that happens after the fire is critical and the cleansing that happens during the fire is critical. In June, PG&E pleaded guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter for the role its power lines played in starting the 2018 campfire that destroyed almost 19,000 structures, including Seton's home. Now it will deploy drones to spot equipment issues before they spark a fire. This was a historic moment and hopefully historic moment for corporate America to know that prosecutors wherever will not allow them to get away with recklessly endangering the lives of the citizens that they serve. The biggest innovations in fire management recently are in how data is used for better mapping and earlier detection. Two NOAA-operated geostationary satellites can take pictures every 30 seconds from 22,000 kilometers above Earth. Higher resolution images are taken twice a day by four NASA satellites orbiting the poles. These satellites have heat sensors that detect fire activity, while aircraft collect nighttime infrared imagery and are experimenting with faster daytime detection. Around the world, those data are transmitted in real time to people who need to make decisions, oftentimes in the form of a text message for a forest manager or a park ranger about the location of a new fire detection somewhere within the boundaries of their management. To make decisions about firefighting tactics, crews often need a closer view. There's a growing network of hundreds of remotely controlled pan and tilt cameras in fire-prone areas, run by a group of seismologists led by Graham Kent. What this really allows dispatch to do in about a minute or two is to take the 911 call, point the camera, and then scale their response. More than a dozen of the cameras have been burned over so far this season, but the vast majority are still operational. One successful story of their use was during San Diego's Lilac Fire in 2017. They literally had the camera on it within a minute. That shows you how fast people call things in. And the Chief Meacham from CAL FIRE made a decision he would normally not make. He put all 43 trucks out in three minutes. That halted the fire at 4,000 acres. The public can access these live camera views and those satellite images too. But satellite data is not easy for everyone to read. Now, Google is integrating it into maps, adding fire perimeters to the world's most widely used navigation app. It's also added quick stats in search, like location, size, and road closures. In 2017 and before, we would show a map of the affected area, but we could only drop a pin showing that a fire was happening somewhere there. And a pin wasn't super helpful for users who were trying to figure out, well, how close am I to that fire? Is it going to come and affect me and my town? Whether it comes from Google or public officials, it's never been more important or more difficult to make sure the information being communicated during an emergency is accurate. One really, really terrible mistake is counties will only map their own evacuations. And so the evacuation stops at the county line. And if you live on the other side of that county line, and you look at that county's map, you may think you're safe, but really you're just not looking at the right map. Some who misread U.S. fire maps, which only show U.S. data, turn to Twitter and Facebook to call the fires and climate change a hoax. And false rumors that anti-fascist activists deliberately set fires led some to ignore evacuation orders for fear of looting. While I think the government agencies are doing a great job uh, promoting preparedness, when the incident actually occurs, if you don't know if it's near you and you don't know where to get more information, none of that really matters. 
Evacuation alerts are typically sent out by emergency operations centers that partner with various providers, now including Google. Being able to tell the public what they need to tell them in those critical moments is hugely impactful in terms of saving lives. Google is testing out a new SOS alert system for users who opt in to have their location tracked. The ability for firefighters to communicate immediate orders in person is also key. Evacuation orders are often still given by firefighters on foot going door to door. One better solution is offered by the long-range acoustic devices that can give exceptionally loud announcements audibly over helicopter noise. This is only a test. Communication between firefighters is also difficult and can be deadly. 19 firefighters died in a 2013 fire in Arizona, in part because heavy radio traffic made it hard to locate them. Now, some agencies are using game-changing software called Tablet Command. You can see our folks, where they're at, access, GPS, whether satellite view or street view, where the fire hydrants are at. The benefit of that is that when uh, things are pretty crazy out there and, and folks are taking action, is that I know exactly where each engine is via the AVL and GPS locator, so that if something, we can't get a hold of them, uh, I know exactly where they're at. But for now, simple calls to 911 are the fastest way most fires are caught. So opening the door for the public to share information directly with fire agencies may be the key for more targeted responses to stop a fire from getting out of control. The end user can submit road closure information, but I think there are so many more ways in which we can have that two-way communication happen. If people could communicate back to their first responders or back to their you know, sheriff's department or fire department, hey, I've evacuated, I'm now over here, it would help close those gaps and reduce some of those inefficiencies. Google's involvement is one big example of how innovation in publicly funded firefighting is coming primarily from the private sector. Yet startups in the fire space have difficulty raising funds because products likely won't make much money since they need to be sold to fire agencies already strapped for cash. Money is always an issue and firefighters are always trying to get better equipment, more equipment. And so it's a, it's a constant struggle. I've never worked for a fire department that had loads of surplus with nothing to spend it on. For big innovations to be tested and adopted, more money is key. But recent fire spending bills have had a hard time making it out of Congress. When it happens all at once, it creates such a drawdown on the state as far as the equipment, personnel. So it's been very challenging. While I think federal funding is really important, maybe communities need to invest more in their own wildfire preparedness. And maybe that's where the private sector could kick in. But there is something for the public to do beyond throwing money at the worsening problem. Anyone living in wildfire-prone areas should clear a defensible space around their house. There's innovations here, too, like an anti-flammable coating that's been sprayed on celebrity homes like Neverland Ranch. If you ask to evacuate, do it, do it. Um, what we're finding is fires are burning faster and hotter than ever before, and the time for people to get out is less and less, and it's more dangerous. Having lost my house and the material things of that, they're all replaceable. So having a grab bag to go of the sentimental stuff that you can't replace is very critical. Think twice about moving to dangerous areas. Sign up for emergency alerts in your region. If you see a fire, call 911 immediately. And big picture, cutting back on carbon emissions can make a dent in the long-term trend of worsening fires around the globe. This problem is bad today. It's going to get worse as our planet warms. And so part of our action has to be attention to greenhouse gases to work on the problem of wildfires and the growing threat that wildfires pose to our communities, we need to work on the threat of climate change.